اللهم اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونشكره ونستعين به سبحانه وتعالى ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ به جل وعلا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا عباد الله أنصحكم ونفسي الآثمة بتقوى الله أحثكم وإياها على طاعته وأحذركم وإياها وبال مخالفته جل وعلا ومعصيته وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره الكافرون اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على هذا النبي الأمين وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين ورضي الله عن صحابته الغر الميامين وعنا معهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين أما بعد عباد الله يقول الله سبحانه وتعالى في المحكم بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الشهر الحرام بالشهر الحرام والحرمات قصاص فمن اعتدى عليكم فاعتدوا عليه بمثل ما اعتدى عليكم واتقوا الله The ayah is in Surah Al-Baqarah And the general meaning of the ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says الشهر الحرام بالشهر الحرام It means the sacred month for the sacred month One month for a month والحرمات قصاص it means that aggression and transgression is punishable فمن اعتدى عليكم whoever attacks you فاعتدوا عليه بمثل ما اعتدى عليكم then you have the right to take punishment that is equal to the damage that's been done to you واتقوا الله and then have taqwa of Allah of course, this is a great ayah in the Quran among all the ayahs of the Quran, and all the ayahs of the Quran are beautiful. But this is among the ayahs that people try to uh, sort of bend to uh, either uh, blemish Islam or to attack Muslims and say, look, you want to attack people? Huh? That's not how it is. Let's see what the ayah, first of all, indicates in a general sense. First of all, Ashahru al Haram. What is Ashahru al Haram? The sacred month. Number one, Ashar al-Haram before Islam, pre-Islamically in the Jahiliyyah, the Arabs in the peninsula used to have this Ashar al-Haram. They'd call it Ashar al-Haram. Why do they call it Haram? Because they say the sacred month, it is not allowed that you carry weapons in that month. You cannot uh, fight in that month, even before Islam. You cannot kill in that month. You cannot punish in that month. You cannot do anything. This that the, this month, Ashar al-Haram, is a month of peace. Well, that's even before Islam. Of course, we have four sacred months. The Ashar al-Haram, four: the Al-Qa'da, and the Al-Hijjah, and the Muharram, and Rajab. Rajab, Mudar, the tribe of Mudar. Of course, if you know the genealogy of the Arab tribes in the peninsula, Mudar is almost the mother of all. Rabi'a wa Mudar. Yani, uh, those are basically the uh, leaders of all the Arab tribes. Mudar made Rajab a month that's sacred because they decided to do Umrah in that month. So the Arabs then before Islam used to go to Mecca, to al kaaba al-Musharrafa and do Umrah in that Rajab, in the month of Rajab, in the sacred month. And then the three months, the Al-Qa'da, wa the Al-Hijjah, wa uh, Al-Muharram are months where no blood should be shed, period. And the Arabs in that time respected that. As you all know, even before Islam. <coughs> before Islam, among the characteristics of men, according to the Arabic, in the Arabian, Arabian Peninsula, was your word. Your word as a man means your bond, means you as a character. This is also among the things that Islam not only uh, 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 supported but reinforced, just like the concept of Ashar al-Haram. Islam supported that concept and reinforced it and also this matter of word and noticed and Nabi Al-Azam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in hadith sahih he was asked Ya Rasulullah would the uh, mu'min uh, would the mu'min steal they could steal 
They do this, yeah, they do this. They do that, they do that. Hal yakdhib? Would the mu'min lie? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, la yakdhib. No. Al mu'min la yakdhib. The mu'min does not lie. Regardless. SubhanAllah. Something that the Arabs before did. And Islam came to reinforce that a mu'min, that a believer in Allah and the day of judgment cannot lie, period. I'll give you examples. One man from Rajul Man Bani Abs, one man from Bani Abs, Bani Abs uh, tribe, Al Hajjaj, in the time of Al Hajjaj, Bani Yusuf Al Thaqafi, of course, you know, revolutions came against the Hajjaj. Al Hajjaj as a tyrant, Taghiya, people revolted against him. Many revolutions uh, rev uh, went against him. Uh, Al Hajjaj, uh, his daily routine was shedding blood. Among these people uh, that, uh, that did the revolution against the Hajjaj was a man called Abdul Rahman ibn Ash'ath. This Abdul Rahman ibn Ash'ath, he, he led a revolution against the Hajjaj. Two young men from Bani Abs were, were with him. Young men uh, were with him. And the revolution of Abdul Rahman ibn Ash'ath against the Hajjaj failed. And the Hajjaj, of course, as you know, killed them all. Al Hajjaj would, would, he tells he, would, he has a history of telling people if I order you to go out of this door and you go out of the other, I will shed your blood. No problem. Huh? Blood has no value to him. Believe or not believe, right or wrong, huh? enforcing what he thought is right, even on the cost of the book and the sunnah of the Prophet. ﷺ. So much that among the things that they say about Hajjaj, that one time Al Hajjaj was washing himself in the Euphrates River. River in Iraq, as you know, Euphrates River, and he doesn't know how to swim, so he almost was drowning. Uh, he's drowning, and he yelled out for help, help me, help me, help me. And some people are thinking, should we help him? This is a tyrant, this is our opportunity. Huh? But one of the guards went and pushed himself and swam very, very, very strongly, and he got him, and he saved him, and he brought him to the shore. After the Hajjaj recovered, he said, uh, Look, I know all of you hate me. Uh, I know that. I know you want me to die. Why did you save me? He said, Ya Amir, I was worried that you would die drowning, then you would die shaheed. <laughs> uh, you drowned, then maybe, maybe Allah forgives your sin, so I, I saved you. Subhanallah. Some people are like that. Namudduhum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives people sometimes more span. Huh? Why? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sealed the evidence against them in the day of judgment. Notice? We'll talk about that some other time. Right. Al Hajjaj, when that revolution failed, he got everyone that's involved. Everyone that was involved in the revolution of Abdul Rahman ibn Ash'at, he got him to kill him. They told him the intelligence of Al-Hajjaj and Mukhawarat. They told him uh, there's only two people left. Who are these two people? They said these are two young men from Bani Abs. Get them. We can't get them. We don't know where they are. Get their father. They got their father. Their father was a pious man. He came to Al-Hajjaj. What do you want? He says, I want your two youth that were fighting against me. Where are they? He said, they are hiding in such and such location. Truly, the soldiers of Hajjaj went to that location and they found the two young men and they brought them. The Hajjaj looked at this man, he said, why, why, have, why did you tell me the truth? You knew I was going to kill them. He says, because my two children are less important to me than breaking my promise of not lying to Allah Jalla Jalalu. Hmm. I would not lie to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Notice. So the Arabs have, beef, even before Islam, and after Islam, of course, it was reinforced. They had this character. Okay, in the month of uh, Shar al-Haram, the sacred month, no weapons shall be, shall, shall be carried. Nothing, no blood shall be, shall be shed. Period. It's a month of peace. Okay. Asbab al-Nuzul. Al-Shahr al-Haram bil-Shahr al-Haram wal-Hurumat al-Qasas. What's the Asbab al-Nuzul? Asbab al-Nuzul are simple. And Nabi al-Azam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the sixth year of Hijrah, we wanted to do Umrah with his Sahaba, Allah alayhim. So they went all to Mecca to do Umrah. That was in the month of Dhil-Qa'dah, 
Of course, why do we call Dhul Qaeda Qaeda from Yaqa'ud from sitting? The Arabs used to sit in that month again, reinforcing the meaning that they would not fight, they would just sit, huh? and they would uh, sort of worship their idols, whatever they were worshiping. In that month of Dhul Qaeda, the sixth, sixth year of Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ with his companions went to Mecca and with the intention of Umrah. It was in the month of the sacred month. All of a sudden, what happened? Quraysh came. Huh? They took their weapons. They uh, started throwing arrows at the Prophet Wasallam. They broke that, san that sanity or that, that status of that sacred month. Huh? Okay, you all know now, we don't want to go into this, but you all know that the Prophet Wasallam went back to, to Medina, and then he returned back the next year with that agreement that he would go the next year for Umrah for three days. And of course, the Muslims were allowed at that time when they went back the next year, they went back the next year in the same month, Dhul Qaeda, to do Umrah, and the Muslims at that time with the Prophet Wasallam, they carried their own personal arms, only personal arms. Everyone has their own personal arm, they carried it with them. Huh? Al-Qur'an comes to say, Al-Shahr al-Haram bil-Shahr al-Haram. You, Ya Rasulullah, did not break the sacred, the sacred status of the month, the sacred month. They broke it, and when the Muslims went back to Mecca carrying their personal arms, that is just for that. Don't, don't feel, don't think that this is you. You are the one who broke it. You are that. Don't think that you are the one who initiated the Muslims. Basically, this is to the Muslims, not to the Prophet You are, you are not the one who. Initiated this, nor you are the one who started this. But I want you to take, I want to take you to a little bit higher point in this. The Muslims were not pushing equally. What do I mean? The when the kuffar pre prevented the Prophet ﷺ from entering Mecca, they threw arms at him and they fought him and they started a war. When the Muslims came back to Mecca, yes, they did carry the weapons in the sacred month, but they carried one personal weapons. Number two, those weapons were for defensive, not offensive, like Quraysh did in the month before, in the year before. Notice, there's a big difference. Al Quran comes to say this: Al Shahr al Haram bil Shahr al Haram. Of course, now having Al Shahr al Haram, the sacred month, the people of Quraysh were sitting comfortably. It was like a sort of a peace, temporary peace. What? Why do I say temporary peace? Well, because the Jahiliya society before Islam, what, what, kind, what was this, what kind of society was Quraysh? Quraysh was a society that was living basically on violence. They were living on stealing, robberies, the desert. That's how. They, that's what. That was their life. The society of Quraysh before Islam viewed people who have a job, a, a, a peaceful job. And this man has, uh, for example, people who do agriculture. There's not much agriculture to do in this desert, desert. But those who did some kind of agriculture, the society of Quraysh and the elite of Quraysh looked at them as, uh, those are men. What kind of man would do agriculture farming? Farmer? There must be a missing characteristic of manhood. Those are weak people. What should, what should the powerful people and the big people do? They should take their swords and rob people of their money. Huh? And the more of a robber you are, the more honored you are in that structure of that society. Notice, huh? this is the society that was before Islam. Uh, and Islam, when Islam came, looked at the society and of course Islam came to reform societies for happiness, of course, and peace. Look at the society of Quraysh, a structure that is based on who robs the other, the weak is dead, or the weak is enslaved, and the rich enslaves the poor, etc, etc. This is not right. And the diagnosis of that society was two things. Number one, there's a lack of knowledge, and number two, there is no work. People don't work in Quraysh. There's no job. The job is robbery. Therefore, Al-Islam went to institute these two important things. Number one, At-Ta'lim, education. And Nabi Al-A'zam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made it an obligatory, uh, uh, obligatory fard, basically, section on every individual, every accountable human being must learn, period. You must learn. 
Of course, Islam also emphasizes knowledge. يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتٍ People, هَلْ يَشْتَوُوا الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Are they equal, those who know and those who don't know? All these ayahs in the Qur'an came to emphasize the need for acquiring knowledge, the need for knowledge, because uh, as in the hadith says, that the uh, uh, honor of the scholar is, uh, is uh, on the rest is like the honor, like the fadl, like the bounty of the Prophet ﷺ on the ummah. And of course, as you know, in the narrations that says one one alim is stronger on the shaitan than one thousand abid, etc., etc., etc. All these things, basically pushing for what? For acquiring knowledge to rise, education, right? We always say there is no education is price is priceless, priceless, priceless. Because those who know are not equal to those who know. And no matter how much education costs, it is very much justified. You think education is expensive? Try ignorance. Hmm? Right. That's the first thing. The second thing now, the Prophet ﷺ employed the, uh, the condition or the uh, uh, idea of war. You have to have a job. Huh? Not only, you cannot just live off of other people, you cannot rob people and steal people's money and kill them and shed their blood. Not only you should stop during the sacred months, but you should stop all the time. You should have a job. You should be productive in your society. You should contribute positively to the society that you live in. This was the concept. And the Prophet ﷺ did not just say that theoretically. He himself rolled up his sleeves and went to work with his own honorable hands ﷺ. Huh? And then also you see a Sahaba, you see everybody now. Everyone rolled their sleeves and started working like the Prophet ﷺ. Lead by example to show them that actually having a job is not a shame. If you do agriculture, is not a shame. If you do farming, is not a shame. If you do this, is not a shame. If you're a carpenter, it's not a shame. If you're a shepherd, it's not a shame. The prophets, they take, they took care of the of sheep. They were shepherds. The prophets were carpenters, etc. And not, you're not more honorable than the prophets. Notice, and this is how the Sahaba, Allah went into this atmosphere of being productive, working, and acquiring knowledge at the same time. Huh? What did that do to society? It re it's a revolution. This is, an, uh, this is a, an educational revolution. This is a social revolution. It actually changed the entire society from a non-productive society to a very productive and positive society where people were respected. What do I mean by that? Well, in the pre-Islamic society, the powerful was respected and was feared. The one who killed more was feared. The one who did this was feared. The one who was from a certain clan was respected. The one from a certain tribe was respected. The one who inherited money was respected. Uh, what I'm saying, some people are saying in their minds, well, it's still up till today. Well, yeah, sure. Jahiliya thinking. Remnants of Jahiliya. That's what it is. Okay. And because if the society is structured like that, what happens to society? Now you have levels and layers in society. Huh? Layers in society, very obvious. You all know, until very recently, the Indian system, for example, of the caste, the caste system. The Persians had also their own caste system. What do I mean by that? Well, the, according to Persians, they had three levels in society. The level of the workers and the farmers, that was the lowest level. The levels of the learned and the levels of those who rule and the uh, rulers and the governors and the umara. Huh? Those were one level. And no matter how smart you are, no matter what a genius you could be, if you are from the farmers and the workers level, you can never go and get an education and become from the learned level. Why? You're not the same. Huh? But that's not only that. Upon that, there's application that's social. For example, you cannot marry. You cannot marry from that, that, that level. You cannot deal with that level. You are always a servant to that level, that, that caste that's above you. Notice. But that's not only in the Eastern societies, but also uh, look up the Greek, all the Greek understandings of society. Yeah, and some of the, those Greek uh, philosophers, uh, they want to say, uh, or thinkers if you were to say, they want to say that women and slaves have the uh, mind of animals. Mm -hmm. That's it, that's their limit. Their minds are like animals. If you're a woman or you're a slave, what does that mean? They enslaved you, they made you a slave, they gave you a new title, you're a slave now. Mm -hmm. 
So that means you're uh, according to that Greek uh, thinker, then you are just uh, you are like, your thinking is maximum like an animal. You can never be a human being to start with. Not even among the castes. You're not even there. Notice. Al-Islam came to change all this by this ayah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhan nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lita'arafu, inna akramakum indallah atqa'kum. O oh people, uh, all mankind, ya ayyuhan nas, mankind, not ya ayyuhan ladhina aman, ya ayyuhan nas, oh human beings, everybody. Inna khalaqnakum. Allah says, we have, and which means, we have created you from males and females, both genders. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُبًا وَقَبَالٍ And we made you into nations and tribes so you can get to know each other and work with each other. The best ones among you are those who have the most taqwa. No caste, no farmers, no this, no that, huh? No males, no females. The one amongst you who is best is the one who has the most of taqwa. Now we don't want to go into taqwa, but what does taqwa mean? Taqwa has reflection on two things. Taqwa is a relationship between you and Allah Jalla Jalalu, and a relation, it should reflect also on your relationship with the creation of Allah. Since we cannot judge the status of your relationship with Allah, but we can judge the reflection of your relationship with the creation of Allah. If someone has taqwa, that will be reflected on their dealings with the creation of Allah. And I don't mean just the human beings, I mean everything. And I don't only mean Muslims among the human beings, I mean all human beings. That taqwa then is reflected. Notice? So therefore you see Al-Islam change that society now from a point of being not productive to productive, not only that, it changed it to be now in the leading position to tell people that education and job and being a positive contributor to society is an integral Islamic value. الشهر الحرام بالشهر الحرام then the sacred month for the sacred month you have not uh, committed an aggression you have actually protected yourself but you did not commit the aggression nor have you initiated the aggression والحرمات قصاص والحرمات قصاص means the ayah means that aggressions and transgression is punishable why? because this whole deen is based on justice عدل Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala among his names العدل this society is based on Adil. Everything, if it's, it needs to succeed, it must be based on Adil. If there is Dhul, then things go right and like this and that. So therefore we believe in the Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ensure, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, that justice will be ensured and will prevail. And therefore, any aggression will be punishable. Notice Al-Hurmat Qisas. Now the ayah continues to say, فَمَنْ يَعْتَدَى عَلَيْكُمْ فَاعْتَدُوا عَلَيْهِ بِمِثْلِ مَا اَعْتَدَى عَلَيْكُمْ Whoever attacks you, huh? then you have the right to take equal punishment from them. Or to attack them equally in a sense, if you were to translate it literally. What does that mean? Now the uh, criminal justice uh, scholars, of Islamic criminal justice scholars, they take from this few things. Number one, they take from this ayah that you have the right to defend yourself. As a human being, you have the right to defend yourself, your honor, and your dignity. It's a basic human being. If you don't have that, then uh, nothing makes, it, it makes, makes sense. What's the other thing also? That not only you have the right to defend your, your, your dignity and honor, but you also have the right to gain back your rights that are stolen from you. Something, something is taken from you, then you have the right to get it back. This is the, basically the meaning of this ayah. But when someone reads this ayah and without understanding of the ayah, may say, well, uh, uh, this is here, that means you can, if someone does you wrong, you do them wrong. So if someone attacks you, you attack them equally. Where is the mercy of Islam? Where is the humanity in Islam? Where is uh, all these things, uh, all these nice words that uh, people come up with? Beautiful. Number one, if someone attacks you, does Islam, did Islam leave you to go and you attack him yourself? You take your own rights? No, Islam put all these things within the parameter of the law. Huh? Sharia al-Islamiyya, which is the law, then protected peoples. What do I mean by that? Someone's father is killed in the old days. 
they go, he wants to go and get his right, he wants to kill. Of course, Islam, we in Islam, we have, uh, if someone is murdered, then there's two ways. Either there is a forgiveness from that family who was, uh, who was murdered, or the one who, the murderer, must be also killed. That's death sentence for that murder. Two options. Like, can you ensure that that son of that murdered person would go and find the killer? Can you ensure that he would kill him only? Mm. Can you ensure that he would not kill his whole family? Huh? Time of anger. Can you ensure that he would not torture him before he kills him? Because that's not what Islam says. Islam did not say you can torture him. Huh? People torture nowadays. But that's not even, that's not Islamic, nor is it humane value. Al Islam, no. Don't, don't go excess in excessiveness in these things. Huh? Be careful. Why? Those are other human beings that also have rights. They did a mistake. That mistake is punishable by an equitable punishment. That's it. That's it. You have no more than that. And that punishment purifies them, in, fact, in a matter of fact. So, can you ensure these things? You can ensure these things. I'll give you an example. One man from Bani Tamim, his kid, kids were playing with kids. One of the kids killed this man's kid of Bani Tamim. Tamimi, Tamimi, they killed his kid. So the other tribes from the, from the other ones, they get, got themselves together. They brought that young man and they brought money and they brought offers. And they went to the father of that one who was killed. And they said, you know, we understand what happened, that person was killed, and here's our son. You want to kill him? Fine. You don't want to kill him, you want to ask for money instead, we, will, we are willing to give you whatever you ask for. Any other options that you want, we are listening to whatever you want. And he looked at them, and he said, I only accept three things. What? Number one, that you bring the stars of the skies down to me. How can you bring the stars down? Because we can't do this. Number two, he said, that you revive my own son. So he brings, he comes back to life. He said, we can't do that. Number three, that I kill every single one of your tribe. Huh? This is how some people sometimes, this is how some people think. Huh? Sometimes, what does that mean? Guilty by association. What is guilty by association? Just because you are from that city, you should die. Just because you are from that tribe, you should die. You know, I didn't do anything. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. لا تزيروا وزيرة وزراء أخرى. The Quran and Karim, everyone is accountable for their own. How come you just... But this is how some people do that. Until today, some people do that. Hind bin Tu'atba, the wife of Abu Sufyan, when she went to Wahshi, Wahshi was Abd, Mamluk lil Harith bin Kilda, one of the people of Quraysh. He was a slave to al Harith. She looked at Wahshi, she told him, yeah, she asked who is, one, who is the one that, that has the most uh, pre, uh, precise shooting uh, among the slaves. They told her Wahshi, that uh, big man uh, uh, went to him. She told him, yeah, Wahshi, you see your master, Al-Harith bin Kilda? She says, yes, I see him. She says, I will replace his weight gold for you. And I will buy you and I'll free you. You will be free. What do you want instead? What do you want in return? She told them that Muhammad, she said, Inna Muhammadan, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she said, Inna Muhammadan, Muhammad killed some men of my family that were very close to me. And what I want you to do, he said, what do you want me to do? Kill him? She said, no, either him, or Ali, or Hamza. Notice. And I thought, what is the... Okay, you, you have a problem with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What does Hamza have to do with this? Huh? What does Ali have to do with this? But she said, either one of those. Why? It's that Jahiliya concept until today. One tribe kills from one, and the other tribe goes and kills anyone from that tribe. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter who's guilty. Doesn't look for the killer. It kills the kids of the killer. No problem. Yani, uh, Busr bin Abi Arta al-Amiri, the one who uh, was sent by Sham to Yemen, he went to Al-Yaman to look for Ubaidullah ibn Abbas. Ubaidullah, Mu'abdullah. Ubaidullah ibn Abbas was appointed on Al-Yaman as a ruler. Busr ibn Abi Atta, he did not find Ubaidullah. 
Because the ruler, ruler of Damascus, he wanted Ubaidullah. So he didn't find him. So he went and found the two children of Ubaidullah ibn Abbas. Qatham wal Abbas. Two children. They were both infants. They did not exceed two years. Busr ibn Abi Atta took them and slaughtered them like he slaughtered sheep. What, what is their... What, what's their... Uh, what's their guilt? No. I want their father. I didn't find their father. I killed his children. Okay. This is then what happened, of course, as you know, Hamza Allah Ta'ala Ali was killed. Now, this understanding, Al Quran Al Kareem wanted to say, Famani Atada Alaikum, whoever attacks you, you should just take equal retribution. Do not go excessive with Taqullah. Fear Allah. Have the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't go in excess. Torturing that one that you want to kill is not part of the killing, it's not part of the equal justice for justifiable retribution. Doing this, doing that, huh? no, all, the, all these things. Alhamdulillah, Hamdan Kathiran Kama Amar, Ashadu Allah, Ilaha, Illa Allah, Wahda, Hula, Sharika, Laho, Irgama, Liman, Jahada, Bihi, or Kafar, Washadu, and Sayyidana, Muhammad, and Sallallahu, Ali, or Ali, or Salam, Khatam, and Bia, and Mortabar, Salilahum, or Salim, or Barak, Allah, the Nabi, or Allah, Ali, he, Ali, Fukhi, or another, or Elmi, or Athar, or Alam, and Bia, Athari, he, Muktafa, or Kabar. Again, some people still, they say, well, you know, still you're saying, if one does you wrong, you do him wrong. No, we don't say if one does wrong, he also must be done wrong. We say if one is wrong, does, does something wrong, then there must be justice. Justice must, be, uh, prevail, must prevail. But then some people say, how can you then equalize between this ayah? If someone does you wrong, then you also take equal punishment from them. With the ayah that Allah says, وَلَا تَشْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيِّئَةَ إِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنَ That the ayah means, the hasana, the good is not equal to the bad. Push, put first the good, and that will wipe the bad. In other words, forgive. Huh? How can you say this? The ayah, one ayah says this, and one ayah says that. There's a confusion. Problem in the Quran. No, actually there's absolutely no problem. Here's the, pro here's the problem. The problem is in the understanding of some people. How is that? The first ayah gives you the right, that you have the right for equal justice. But the second ayah tells you, if you forgive, it's better. You have the right for equal justice, yes. But if you forgive, it's better. This is not only theory. The Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, after the Quraysh fought him so long, 23 years they are fighting him every single day, planning every single day. Huh? Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab, Abu Sufyan, all these people, the, basically the leaders of Quraysh. And Nabi al-A'zam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he goes back to Mecca, liberating Mecca. Huh? Liberating Mecca from the idols and the rule and the government of the idols, he goes to the fiercest enemy that was fighting him, Abu Sufyan, and he says, Whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan, he is safe. No. Quraysh, he's the Prophet وسلم, coming with all these people, all the Muslims, thousands and thousands entering Mecca, and they worry, What is going to happen to us now? Huh? And they come and they say, The Prophet وسلم, says, Huh? Uh, he says, he'd look at them and he said, What do you think I'm going to do with you? They said, they look at him and they say, You are honorable, a son of honorables. Indeed he is. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, Idhabu fa Go, you are free. Huh? There was no now equal sense of retribution. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did not take that. But actually he left them. He told them, Go, you are free. Go, you are free. اِذْهَبُوا فَأَنْتُمُوا الطُّلَقَاءِ You are طُلَقَاء uh, Notice now, notice the dealing with the Prophet, of the Prophet وسلم, with these things. When then Al-Qur'an mentions these ayahs, it means at the end if you can forgive, then this is what? This is the soul of Islam. This is the ruh of Islam that you're about to forgive. It's nothing personal. It's always about ensuring justice, but also of justice after the power of, have, of ensuring justice. Can you let it go? If you can, then you are the strong person. You are indeed the person who has the higher moral ground. This is then what Islam wants us to do. And this is the understanding that Islam wants to ha us to have. So we can convert ourselves and reform ourselves into productive, positive human beings in our societies. And also, even sometimes when you are right, it's the Islamic virtue that you say, I forgive.
اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين أعلي يا مولانا كلمة الحق والدين اللهم من أراد بالإسلام والمسلمين خيرا فوفقه إليه من أراد بهم غير ذلك فاجعل دائرة السوء عليه اللهم رد المسلمين إلى دين